we have obviously, oh shoot. Um, can someone maybe go? Oh, you open up that cupboard. Sorry, Ryan, we have a message about uh, the meeting, the other way uh, no being problem. recorded. Have to I just take care the of. Button. So okay, all right, great. We good? Okay, yep, we're good now. Thank you. Three, two, one, you start. Okay. All right. Tonight we are here with Ryan Redman. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ryan, for being here. Um, he's joining us from, I believe, is it Idaho or Utah? Idaho. Yeah. It's over Idaho. by Iowa, Ohio, uh, <laughs> okay, off there in the Midwest. Idaho, I got nervous. Okay. <laughs> from Idaho. Um, let's see. You, Ryan, has been teaching uh, meditation for the past 20 years and is also the executive director of the Flourish Foundation and the co-founder um, of Cultivating Emotional Balance um, with Eve. And so tonight, I believe um, he will be talking about fear or something based on the emotions, <laughs> I believe. I don't think he's going to be doing the, the book that we've been reading. I think we're going to take a, li a little pause still from that. And um, yeah, I, I think that's a, about it. I'll have some announcements at the end, Ryan. So maybe a minute or two to do some upcoming announcements. And thank you so much for being here. And um, I don't know, there's about a dozen or 15 of us here in the room. And uh, let's see, anything else that you need to know? Or I think that's all. Thank you. And what uh, time? What time do I have? Is it to? 8.30. 8.30? Okay, great. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, great. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, hi, everybody in the studio there in San Francisco. I can see, I think, all of you, unless there's people hiding off in the periphery. And then, of course, I've got the Hollywood squares on my my screen with all the people joining online. I see old friends, Lonnie and Stan, who actually Lonnie is another co-founder of CEB, the organization that I feel incredibly fortunate enough to be working with Eve. And so to frame the talk, I'm glad Eve didn't say too much because I, I think the talk that I want to give tonight really happened pretty organically. Maybe a week and a half ago, we were coincidentally surfing in Mexico, and I saw Eve, so I snuck up around her and surprised her out in the water. And as many of you know, I think Eve is a very dedicated surfer, but fortunately, the ocean doesn't always have waves, so Eve has to sit still in the water. So in a, a momentary lull, I asked her, I said, what, what do you think would be interesting to, to share with the folks at the San Francisco Dharma Collective? And she had told me a little bit about what you guys had been focusing on. I wasn't clear what book you guys have been investigating, so hopefully what I offer tonight will supplement that or complement that in some way. But in our conversation, we started talking about the elements, the idea of the different elements, particularly in Buddhism, not the periodic table of elements, which some of you might be familiar with from high school or even college level chemistry. But the elements in terms of these aspects or these constituents of our lived experience that we know directly, phenomenologically, through the mind, through our first-person experience. And so even I were talking about the elements, and I was talking about a practice that I often do, um, probably three or four times a week. I also, along with meditating for many years, I've been committed to a yoga practice. And one of the things that I like to do at the end of my yoga practice, which I'm sure many people are familiar with, is the practice of Shavasana, the, the corpse pose. And there's many ways to understand the corpse pose and its 
function in the yoga practice, probably the, the simplest is it's the most comfortable place to lie to really integrate the impact of doing the various postures or the asana to familiarize oneself with a deep sense of relaxation, but also to develop a sense of clarity. So that I think is indisputably beneficial for, for many people. But over the years, I've, I've developed a, a really keen interest in using the Shavasana as a dress rehearsal for my own death. And so one of the things that I do on a regular basis in the Shavasana is I really draw heavily on the teachings that go all the way back, as far as we know, to the, to the eighth century with a teacher that maybe some of you are familiar with, uh, Indian pundit, um, sometimes called the Mahasiddha, someone who had really extraordinary capacities, paranormal abilities, and left a very deep impression, particularly in Tibetan Buddhism, a teacher by the name of Padmasambhava. And so going all the way back to the teachings of Padmasambhava, there were a number of teachings that he gave related to what are called the six bardos. And the bardos are these transitional phases or phases that we can experience both while living and also in the dying process and then in the intermediate space between that to highlight these critical points in our life that can be skillfully used as a opportunity for liberation. So the, the six bardos, if, if people aren't familiar with them traditionally, are the bardo of living. So we're all very much experiencing that right now. But then of course, within the bardo of living, we have certain kinds of experiences, one being dreaming. So then there's also some extensive teachings on dream yoga and using dreams as a portal for spiritual practice and transformation. And then we also have what's called the bardo of meditation, of really dissolving kind of the coarse mind that we're relating to in our daily life and exploring deeper dimensions of consciousness through the practice of meditation. And then there's a whole set of bardos, the last three, that really deal with the dying process and the intermediate phases in between. So tonight, what I want to focus on is the bardo of dying and a particular practice that I find personally to be very useful. And I'll share a little bit of, of how I see this practice being useful just in a very practical way, but then also in a deeper level philosophically. And so one of the things as I was sitting here thinking about, I kind of have to switch to my alter ego a little bit to, to move ahead or to, to offer these teachings because ordinarily in my nine to five day job, I wear a very secular hat in terms of how I present the practices of meditation and mindfulness. I often work in schools. And so I think these practices in, in some sense, I think they're 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 actually really secular because the the information that's derived or um, the insights that have been gleaned about the bardo of dying are just phenomena that I I I think that anyone has access to if they're really paying attention. And the thing that's unique about these teachings is that ordinarily we we couldn't ask someone if they're valid. Because as they're going through the dying process, then of course, after they've died, then they go through a whole other process. And we may not have access to that person again to um, check what their experience was, to hear, you know, what, what did you experience through these different phases ordinarily? But I think there are such individuals who do have the capacity, have had the capacity where they can actually recall the experience with great vividness and, and detail. And so partially, this is where these teachings are coming from. And there's probably some overlap in parallel, although I haven't looked at this, with 
studies done on near-death experiences. I think a, a book that maybe some of you are familiar with and that you've encountered in your Dharma practice over over the years is uh, Soigo Rinpoche's book, The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And so he brings in a little bit of that, drawing upon psychological research to see, as there... Is there any common ground between what the Buddhists are saying? Here's how the dying process unfolds from the inside, phenomenologically. What do people actually experience from the inside? We know from the outside, there, there are clear signs as someone's going through the dying process of things they experience, with the culmination of that being the heart stops and brain activity stops. But what happens from the inside? And so there's been some, as, a, as far as I know, there's been some collaboration. I haven't looked into it with great detail, but I know there, there is some overlap that's been discovered. And then, of course, for those of you that have spent time with people who are going through the dying process, maybe working through um, organizations like hospice or just intimately with your own family. I was with my, my mother-in-law a few months ago, and... Um, had the great privilege of supporting her as she was moving through the dying process. And it was quite fascinating to also be familiar with these teachings and to see how they dovetailed with the things, the outer signs that she was displaying. And so, so many of you might have your own, your own first town account of this in, in people you've been with already. But the reason I have to draw my alter ego is I'm going to go very Buddhist. You know, and I'm, I'm going to rely a lot on Buddhism and I'm not going to try to kind of skirt around certain things and, um, you know, necessarily bring the teachings into a more secular context because I, I, I don't think it's really necessary. I, again, for the reasons I already explained, I think this is entirely phenomenological in terms of what people have observed. It's been corroborated by many people who've gone through the dying process. So I think there's 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 plenty of data already here to work with that we don't necessarily have to kind of step out of the side and say, hey, wait a minute, our Western paradigm doesn't talk about this. So gosh, are we now going kind of ultra religious and either we kind of believe this or not. But I think there's, again, just a lot of prior experience, a lot of consensus around these these experiences that we can have confidence in them. So that's kind of where I'm starting from. And that's what I hope to offer with some clarity and, and hopefully the teachings will be of benefit and maybe inspiring for you to start bringing back into your own life. So I think before we go any further, a good question that maybe we should start asking ourselves is, you know, as we hear this, you know, other than, gosh, this might be really interesting. And, you know, I'm here, it's, it's Wednesday night and I, I normally come to this group, you know, so I'm just kind of, I'm open to see what, what Ryan has to say or whoever might be teaching these teachings. But, you know, I'm just, I'm just not so sure, you know, I, I think there's other teachings that would be more useful to me. And, I would, I would like to argue that the one thing that we know for certain, and often people will say death and taxes, although in the United States, I, I think maybe taxes, now there's so many people that have found ways to skirt around that if you're really clever. So maybe it's just death is for mm -hmm. certain. But we can say death is really something that we know for certain. It's inevitable. But what make these teachings really important is that the time of death is uncertain. And again, I, I, I'll just go back to my own experience. My, my mother-in-law, a few months ago, you know, we were just getting ready. We were kind of putting the, the finishing touches on a trip we were going to take to Mexico. Totally good health. And on a Friday afternoon, all of a sudden, we got a call that unexpectedly, she had, she had a fall. And perfectly fine health before that. Uh, there was nothing, no signs. And we'll talk a little bit about that, the signs of death a little bit later, but unexpectedly uh, she had a fall. And then within 24 hours, 
she was going through this dying process and um, then made her transition. So the time of death is uncertain, meaning it doesn't really matter what age we are. Um, I'm sure all of you throughout the course of your life, you've known young people that tragically have passed away, people middle-aged. And of course, as we move throughout our life, we maybe start to anticipate our death and start to think about, oh, now it's time. I've, I've really got to start getting my affairs in order. But really, it could happen to us at any time. So for that reason, I think there's, there's great value knowing that this is going to be certain. How do we start to relate to this experience of our own mortality in such a way where hopefully we can dispel fear? So you mentioned I'd be talking a little bit about fear, so I'll mention that, but we can dispel fear from moving through this process, because I know for myself, and I'm really afraid, it's really difficult to make a dis good decisions. I'm just kind of, you know, in a, in a response of what's out there to get me, what's threatening me, how do I get away? And it's very difficult to access my higher intelligence as the overriding imperative is to evade whatever might be a threat. So, for that reason, I wanted to pull in also the words of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who I pulled a quote out of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And His Holiness goes on to say how to prepare for death, how to undergo the death process with the least trauma, and what comes after death. These are matters of vital importance to every one of us. It would be impractical of us not to study these issues with the greatest of care and not to develop methods of dealing with death and the dying in a skillful and compassionate way. So I think this idea of really thinking about what's practical, if we heed to the vice of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, if we deny this reality of death and we're orienting our practice in other ways, but we're not creating space and time to bring these practices in, his insight is that that would be a really impractical way to be approaching the Dharma. So I'll give a personal story about this that I thought was really meaningful. Again, I don't teach these teachings often. I I practice them, but I haven't really taught them often just because of the context that I'm, I'm often working in and it just hasn't felt appropriate. But on occasion, I, I do get the inspiration. And so about a month ago, because death was so much in the air in my, my family, I had a, a group of people that came together and there was one woman who I've kind of known peripherally over the years, really, really sweet woman, but has a very aggressive form of multiple sclerosis MS. And so she's happily, she's still pretty mobile, but over the years I've watched her deteriorate to, to the point where she's, she's having a hard time getting around. And I would say, um, as time goes on, I think her, her bandwidth of activities will continue to diminish further and further. And so with this, I think naturally she's began to start thinking about her death. So in the class that I was teaching, I brought this up at the end that we were going to go into Shavasana and we were going to do this, this meditation on the process of dying and knowing that she's living with a life-limiting illness, um, a chronic illness, and one that that may position her a little bit closer to death than, than others. But again, as I said before, it's totally uncertain. You know, I just didn't know how this would land for her. And so we went through this meditation. And when she came out of the practice, and we, we just opened up the space for people to share about their experience. I was really inspired by 
what she shared about her experience and what she said from, from doing this meditation. Again, this was the first time she'd ever been exposed to these teachings and first time she'd ever done anything like this. She said, up until now, every time I think about death, always, always I experience fear. And so I try not to think about it. And what was really interesting in going through this practice, and in the practice, there's an invitation to really be relaxed, to allow ourselves to be at ease. So we're moving through the process with as little resistance as possible. She said, with that invitation to relax, to be at ease, and to really kind of put everything out on the table, if you will, and look at it. She said, it felt very liberating that all of a sudden I might be able to face my own death. And I've, I found that to be very powerful. And it was kind of one of those moments in, in teaching. There's a, a hidden rubric where you know certain things happen, where people gain certain in, insights. And the hidden rubric is, God, if that's all that ever came out of this experience of teaching, of offering teachings to, to other people in, in my community, that would be worth it. That would be enough to know that here's a woman who I care about, who internalized these teachings and was able, at least in that moment, to make a cognitive shift where she could imagine and envision herself comfortably starting to face her own death. So I found that to be really inspiring. And it would be an aspiration that I have if you're if you're new to this practice or if you're very familiar with it, hopefully it will kind of reinforce that comfortability and maybe deepen some insights about the process. But if you're new to the practice, that would really be my aspiration. And the aspiration that I would invite you to have as you go into the practice, to really look at the practice not as something to add to your intellect, but as something that you might be able to internalize to become more comfortable with the experience, this inevitable transition of dying. So again, if that's all we got, then that was, you know, all that I ever accomplished at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, I'd be super happy. So that's my hope. But of course, I can't wish that for you. I would um, invite you to keep that aspiration for yourself when we move into the practice. And then we'll, we'll just see what happens. And some of the things that we talk about, some of the sensations and the different feelings and how this unfolds, it might agitate us in some way. There may be sensations or feelings that we've had, or maybe we've, we've encountered an experience before we've been close to death. And maybe depending on how that experience was, there may be some unresolved feelings around that. So all of that could begin to surface. So I just want to kind of name that as well and, and give you space to be able to, to look at that and see what would it be like, again, to come face to face with some of these experiences with this sense of ease and relaxation and starting to face things that maybe on the surface feel uncomfortable and very foreign or maybe feel uncomfortable and familiar. So to, to kind of set us up for the practice, what I want to do is I want to go through the practice just once talking about kind of what are the steps for the practice and then we'll see kind of in the the lineage of hearing first and then as we're hearing kind of reflecting on what we're hearing and then finally internalizing those teachings through meditation, we'll see, can we start to generate or drive the greatest sense of wisdom? So really kind of in that spirit is how I'd like us to, to move through this. So first 
getting some understanding. And with that understanding, be kind of thinking about some of the different phases that we'll be moving through, through this process of dying. And then again, we'll see what does that yield or what does that uncover when we go into the practice of meditation. So let me see here. I've got a few notes. So I just want to make sure I'm not leaving anything out that I wanted to address. Okay, great. So how the process of dying just kind of generally looks an overview is there's eight phases. And sometimes they're referred to as the the different stages of dissolution. And often these eight are split into two groups. The first four are relating to the experience of dissolving the elements, which I, I think I already mentioned. When we say elements in this context, we're talking about constituents of lived experience. So if I were to have you close your eyes right now and bring attention or awareness to your body, or you can even keep your eyes open and do this. You don't have to close your eyes, but bring attention and awareness to the body. We can start to notice different sensations and feelings. And as we deepen this awareness, we might experience these sensations relating to different kinds of experience or elements of experience, such as we might feel tingling and vibration as an expression of the air element. Or as you're sitting down, you may become very aware of solidity and earth or groundedness, solidity and groundedness relating to earth. We might even feel the seat is a little bit warm. And we might be aware of the fire element, which has to do with temperature. So that's what we're referring to when we're talking about the elements are these, these constituents that come together in which we then conceptually designate body or wall or chair, but Visually, all we have is shapes and colors, but when we feel them tactily, tact, tactily, we can feel that there are different elements that make it up, but they're elements of experience. Like when I'm reaching down to my chair, I feel like, wow, it's, it's pretty solid. So there must be a lot of earth element in there. It's pretty cold. There's not a lot of fire in there. It doesn't appear to be moving much, so there's not a lot of air in there. So that's what we're talking about. So. We're going to focus first on, on investigating the dissolution of the elements in the body. And of course, there's a connection between the body and the mind. So as we're going through these different elements of the body, the dissolution of the elements, there's also going to be very distinct experiences to be known in the mind alongside this dissolution. So for example, as we're going through the, the first phase, the, the dissolution of earth, along with feeling this profound sense of heaviness, and the body is becoming very slow, we're unable to move, and our, our voice might become very slow, our eyes start to become very heavy, and we start to maybe even lose the sense of the body being differentiated from the floor and it all becomes earth. And we feel sometimes it said there's even a feeling of like sinking into water or underwater, just this kind of heavy weight pressing down on the body and just driving us down into the earth. So as we're experiencing that, there are also some psychological changes that take place. And as that process unfolds more and more in the earth element, not only the body starts to collapse, but in our perception of the environment, it begins to collapse. 
then the distinction of form becomes less and less. And it said that we're left with a vision or the appearance of phenomenon as being more like a mirage than something really solid. So then there's these psychological experiences that dovetail with the dissolution of the elements. So we've got that. So we'll go through the dissolution of the elements and just real quickly, I'll run through what those are. The, the meditation that we'll do, we'll start with the dissolution of earth and then we'll move from the dissolution of earth into water. And then the, we'll experience or envision or imagine or picture the water element slowly collapsing. And that will have a vision associated with it. And as, as water collapses, it collapses into fire. And we'll go through the experience of what happens, what it's what we might experience or anticipate feeling in our body, some of the physiological changes, again, that take place, but also some of the psychological changes that take place with the collapsing of the fire element. And then we'll finish the process, these four outer dissolutions, if you will, of the elements with the air element. And I think the one that obviously most people can recognize when we're with someone who's in the dying process and maybe something we can imagine, or maybe we've even experienced again for, for some period of time, we've had a near-death experience, is that the breath stops. So the dissolution of the air element, and then again, what are some of the psychological changes that take place is, and the, the visionary experience that takes place so that we can clearly recognize this process or lucidly move through this process with, again, awareness. And with this awareness, when we know something, we often are able to then relax, remain calm, be at ease, and know, oh, this is what, what's happening. Water is now collapsing into fire. So we're not freaking out of like, oh my God, I, I didn't expect this. I don't know what's, I don't know what's happening. But we we're very well versed and we can see ourselves, oh, this is the air element beginning to collapse. Oh, I'm having all these visionary experiences about my life, the people I I love, the experiences that I have, the people that maybe I've had difficulty with. So these are all things that we can expect along this journey of moving through the elements. And then <clears throat> after we go through that, these four dissolutions of the elements, then we move into a subtler dissolution of the dissolution first of what's called the, we could call it the white element or the white bindu. And without kind of getting too far away on a tangent, we can say that there's a subtle physiology that's recognized here where uh, particularly when one is embodied again, so they've moved through the whole transitional process of dying um, in the intermediate phase that follows after dying through the, the transitional phase, the bardo of becoming. And then as that phase unfolds, there's, uh, a number of different conditions that come together that would allow the bardo bean, we could say, the person that has, has again, gone through these different phases, these different conditions that come together in which will support the rebirth, the um, incarnation of another form and a few of those conditions coming together, the, the main condition is um, the partnership between a man and a woman so that there's the fertilization of a sperm and an egg. And of course, uh, the, the egg has to be there. And as the sperm and the egg come together, they have a subtle essence associated with them called the white and the red element, the white relating to the, the, the male, the sperm, and the red relating to, to blood 
um, or muscle tissue, um, the hollow organs in the body that then become differentiated out of that, but also the ovum. And as those two come together, and if there's the presence of a continuum of consciousness that is there, a, we could say, AKA a bardo bean that is um, longing for incarnation again, and those all three come together, then we have conception. And so throughout someone's life, then these differentiate and so that the white element goes up to the crown, the red element stays down and below the navel. Uh, they also associate with the white element is often corresponding to consciously, to our consciousness with anger, the emotion of anger, the red element having to uh, relate to desire down below the navel. And it said that after we've gone through the dissolution of the, the elements, then we go through the dissolution of these, these subtle essences, you could say these bindus. And the first is the white element drops down from the crown. And as it starts to drop down from the crown and descend down into the heart, or we could say the, the indestructible bindu at the heart, the heart chakra. So I know I'm now I'm using lots of jargon, so I'm definitely stepping, stepping out of my secular self. And um, I don't want to get too lost in all of this, you know, because it's, it, it, again, I want this to be practical, but I'm just giving you a little bit of the philosophical understanding of what this white element is comprised of. So as that drops down, it the anger that maybe was associated with the white element trans transforms into luminosity. It comes down into the heart and we experience what's called the white appearance. And then simultaneously or after that, the red element starts to move up and ascend up the central channel in the body. So I don't, I don't know how much Eve has shared about subtle physiology in the body, pranas and all of that. Um, so I, I hope I'm not going too far off in left field, but the red element ascends up through the central channel and was associated with desire then turns into bliss and then as those two connect they meet in the heart center then we experience as the red element comes into the heart center we experience the red emergence so we have the white appearance the red emergence and then as they come together we experience what's called the the near dark attainment and this is when the coarse mind the mind that has been configured since our conception as a human mind it now has irreversibly dissolved away so that mind will will never arise again this so for me the mind of um ryan redman that's been configured through all of my experiences with the first configuration being the sperm and the egg of my mom and dad coming together that configuration and that conditioning will dissolve away and we come into the near dark attainment, which for many people it said that stage during the dying process will be a stage where we actually become unconscious. And here's where it gets interesting with some other practices. If one has familiarity, however, with when what happens when the coarse mind dissolves and it goes into what's called the subtle mind, that one could actually be lucid in that experience of the near dark attainment. And when this occurs, it not only occurs in the dying process, but it also occurs in dreamless sleep. We have a moment throughout the night where everything that's happening in our mind, it ceases, it, it dissolves back into this, this space, the, another word for it. And again, I don't know how Eve um, refers to this, if she refers to it at all, has talked about it in the meditation practices, but sometimes in the, the tradition that I'm familiar with, we refer to it as the substrate consciousness. And so it's this consciousness that's prior to any sort of conditioning or configuration, but it's still, um, it's, it's, 
of the nature of ignorance in the sense that it is not realizing the ultimate nature of reality. It's obscuring the ultimate nature of reality, but it's not configured in any way. So, and it also has the, the qualities of being non-conceptual, blissful, which is not a surprise. We already talked about how the white element drops into the heart, or I'm sorry, the um, red element coming up into the heart to make it blissful. And then the white element dropping down into the heart makes it luminous. So luminous, blissful, and non-conceptual. But for most people, it's a very, they call it subtle mind, because for most people, it's just too subtle to notice unless we've trained for that. And how we do this is through the practice of, of shamatha, just quieting the mind and eventually clearing the mind from all perspectives of the mind where the mind actually dissolves like a ice cube. It just dissolves back into this water of the essential nature of the substrate consciousness. So that corresponds to the near dark thing that again is experienced when we fall into dreamless sleep, we faint. Um, you could say one probably experiences it when they're undergoing general anesthesia and also in the dying process, but also in the achievement of Jonathan. So there's access to this subtle dimension of consciousness. So that's the, the third of these processes of dissolution. But then what happens in the dying process, and then this is where this bardo of dying becomes very important to recognize these different phases, is because what happens next is the configuration that holds that substrate consciousness together as something individuated. Again, it's a continuation over time that, that transcends just this lifetime. It's a repository of consciousness from all previous lifetimes we've had, but that individuation of it and the, the kind of that quality of ignorance that um, not knowing the actual nature of ultimate reality or the ultimate ground, that drops away for a moment. That veil is lifted away and we dissolve into what is called the clear light. And so this is why this practice has been highlighted because it's that moment, that dissolution through the near dark attainment. If one has some familiarity with that, ideally a familiarity being a direct experience of that before you get before you've gotten there, then it said we'll recognize it like a child crawling into their mother's lap. So they use this, this classic metaphor for what the experience can be like. So if we have some taste of it before we get there, we can clearly recognize it. And if we can sustain that, then that is utterly transformative and can be uh, completely liberating if we recognize it at that moment through the dying process. And interestingly, so those are the four, but I'll, I'll just say something about this because now we can connect this a little bit to science because everything I just said, you know, people might be going, oh, geez, you know, <laughs> that was that was pretty Buddhist. I didn't sign up for all that. But there is um, some really profound research that's been happening around this because, again, as this is happening all internally, we can say, well, what's happening externally? If someone's going through these, these different phases, can we see things that relate to these, these different stages of dissolution? And the answer is absolutely, yeah. We can see. You can see when the water element is starting to collapse and people's lips get really dry, their, their tongue gets very sticky and pasty. So you can, you can see these things happening on the outside. So it's not a mystery. Um, people getting very cold, they're not moving, they're not getting up anymore. The earth element is really weighing them down, they're heavy. So <clears throat> we can see all those on the outside, but what happens when the breath ceases and then we continue to go through these different phases? Because on one hand, on the one hand, people might say, well, then that's it. There's nothing else that happens. You're, you're just dead and then nothing happens. And if we have a, a worldview, that doesn't 
accommodate for the fact that consciousness may continue on after all brain activity has stopped and the breath has stopped, then we might just kind of throw in the towel there and just say, okay, you know, the person, um, there's nothing left, you know, they've, they've gone into eternity or nothingness or whatever it may be, or just, yeah, they've, they've died. There's nothing, nothing to know, nothing to talk about anymore. But that's not the end of the story. And we've seen this actually scientifically. I have a friend who's done some research on this where he's, he's studied different yogis going through this process and coming to the clear lights of death dissolution. And something very interesting happens when that stage is revealed and it's seized with an awareness, a consciousness that knows it. And again, the consciousness, there's nothing that's actually knowing it from the outside. There's no kind of duality, but it's really, we just come to know ourselves at the deepest level and we're able to sustain that with some stability of mind. It just doesn't kind of flash through. And ordinarily it says, if, if we don't have any familiarity, we don't know what's coming, it may last as long as it takes to eat a meal and then it's gone. And then we're kind of in the next phase. And people, I think in near death experiences will talk about this as being something that's very fulfilling and very meaningful and enriching. But there's some interesting science on this where um, I know one neuroscientist in particular, Richie Davidson, years ago when he started this study, we were, and I don't think he's published this yet, and I wish he would, but he was, he was telling me that he had gotten clearance to bring a, a piece of technology that's used by the US military to, to detect heat or heat seeking missiles. And so they were using this, this instrument that is, that's really refined. And he, he got clearance to bring that into India. It wasn't easy. And he was then paired up with a few yogis that the Dalai Lama recommended. And the Dalai Lama had talked to these yogis and said, hey, scientists want to study this. I mean, we can talk about it like I am until we're you know blue in the face. But until there's some compelling evidence around it, people may not take it seriously. And if they don't take it seriously, then they're going to miss this opportunity of really moving through the dying process lucidly and, and really harnessing the greatest benefit from the experience. And so the Dalai Lama paired Richie up with a number of different people. And at the time he had said he had studied three different yogis that they know definitively went through this process and were able to sustain the clear light of death. And how they know is there, there's a very anomalous thing that happens with people who are able to do this. And that is, as these two, the white and the red element come together and we go through the, the near um, black attainment, and then that dissolves back into the, the clear light. If as someone's resting in the clear light, the pranas in the body will stay converged at the heart. And what that does physically for the body is the body doesn't change in complexion and it actually the, or the complexion of the body doesn't change at all so ordinarily one's complexion will become very pale and dull in these situations the complexion is actually very radiant and bright and sometimes even red which is kind of interesting and there's heat in the body so that's why he was bringing these these device to detect heat and Along with that, sometimes there's a pleasant aroma in the room, and this can last up for, at the time when I had talked to Richie, he had had a yogi that had maintained this for 18 days. It was pretty phenomenal. And he had studied others. And so I said, well, what are you going to do with this? And he said, well, we got to get more evidence so we can publish. So I still, and this was years ago. This was maybe 10 years ago. So I don't think that he's published anything. I've heard him. Um, I prodded some some friends of mine. He was he was giving a public talk, and he asked, him, "Does anyone have any questions?" And I I prodded them. I said, "Ask them about this. This is really interesting." And so he talked about it a little bit. So I said, "I know he's talked about it publicly, but scientifically, we've seen this um, in 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 different people. And then, of course, throughout history, many people have demonstrated this. I just heard the the lineage holder, the teachings that I'm I'm drawing from." 
um, and have been disseminated to me through one of my primary teachers. His primary teacher passed away last year and I think was in the clear light of death for over three weeks. And they were going to cremate his body and they had to keep postponing it because he just kept maintaining this meditation going on and on and on. And in some cases, the clear light of death is maintained with such clarity the lucidity that even the physical structure of the body starts to dissolve away. It begins to shrink. And this brings us into another phenomenon called rainbow body, which I do not want to go into right now because I'm looking at the time and we've been going on for quite some time. So I just wanted to kind of mention that, that there are um, still to this day, people that are really deriving benefit from these practices. And we can see these anomalous signs happening. And it's not just within the Buddhist tradition. I remember reading the account of Yogananda Paramahamsa when he passed away down in Los Angeles and had what sounded like a, this clear light of death experience or this tutam in, in Tibetan Buddhism, as it's called, and maintained that for, for many days. And the coroner in Los Angeles wrote about it. So it's in the the end of his book called Autobiography of a Yogi, if you're ever interested in looking at that. So corroborated from a different tradition. And perhaps, um, you know, Easter's coming up. So I remember, I remember years ago, my kids asked, Dad, what's Easter? And I said, it's when Jesus um, manifested rainbow body. And they were like, what? You know, because they were expecting, you know, it's like when the Easter bunny comes and whatever. And so I made reference to that. And then, of course, that brought up many questions and um, fun story that I could tell at another time. But again, people from different traditions have seen that as people move lucidly through this dying process um, and they're able to really ascertain these different stages of dissolution and particularly the stage of dissolution into the clear light, that there are profound changes that then happen in the body that people can see from the outside. So then we can infer that, oh, here's someone who had some very deep insight into all of this. And we all got to start somewhere. So, you know, if you're like a, a guy living in the boonies like me out in the middle of Idaho, um, it might be Shavasana, you know, three or four days a week where you're starting to gain some familiarity of this. And then over time, maybe this becomes... Like I know, I know Eve told me she's been practicing a lot, suddenly body, speech, and mind. That just becomes almost natural to you when you sit down in a meditative posture. Well, in the same way, as we move into Shavasana, maybe we sense that we're getting close to our death. This all comes back. All these memories come back and this familiarity comes back so that we can move through the, the process consciously. And again, hopefully utilize this experience as something that can propel us along on our path of spiritual transformation. So something like that. So let's practice it. So that was a lot to talk about in theory. Um, I think we'll, we'll probably move through a practice in 25 minutes or something. And then hopefully there'll be a little bit of time for questions. I realized I haven't been doing a great job on time. So I appreciate your kind attention. Um, I see squares kind of popping in and out. And um, yeah, let's really utilize the time that we do have to focus specifically on practice. And then we'll open it up for questions after. I'm afraid if we open it up for questions now, we may never get to practice. And um, it's cool talking about meditation, but I think much better to do it. So let's go ahead and we'll settle into a comfortable posture. And ideally for this practice, you could do this lying down. So maybe if you're at home and you wanna do it in the Shavasana, you could do that. The Actually the ideal position for it would be in the sleeping lion posture, lying on your right side, supporting your head with your right hand, your left arm resting on your left hip. So. You can. But I'm so sorry to interrupt. We have a few people who might be laying down and readjusting. If you can just give us a couple minutes. Oh, great. Perfect. I think yeah. I'm going to have some lying down. We have enough room today. Great. 
I'm going to go on. You, there are more questions, and uh, and they ask like this: If you want to lie down or a yoga mat, and uh, if there's more blankets over there. Yeah. 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 And as people are getting set up, I, I'm not sure people, I might have mentioned this already, but Shava just means corpse. So this is the one posture you can almost rely on that you're going to end up in at some point. You know, who knows how it's all going to unfold, but eventually we're going to end up here. So great to get some familiarity in the, the supine position lying in Shavasana. So for those of you that have found a comfortable posture, you can decide for yourself if you would like to keep the eyes open or practice with the eyes closed. As we'll see in going through the various stages of dissolution, there is a movement that naturally occurs with the eyes. But we'll wait to get there. And so with all that I've shared and offered and heard and perhaps all that you already know that you've experienced and with the sincere acknowledgement of the certainty of death, I invite you to bring forth the aspiration. Use this practice as an opportunity to become more comfortable and familiar with this natural process of dying. So in the same way we have experienced a natural process of being born, because of that, we will also experience a natural process of dying. And so with that in heart and mind, bring forth an aspiration. Use this practice again as an opportunity to become more comfortable with that reality, but also to use it as a platform for transformation and maybe extending our capacity to serve others. And so with this aspiration, this altruistic motivation, let's begin to settle the body in its natural state. We can do initially by releasing any unnecessary activities in the body, the outer level, inwardly. We're invited to release any spiritual practices that we do physically with the body, such as prostrations, circumambulations, and so forth. And secretly, we're invited to adopt a posture, number one, in which the spine can be straight. Arms, hands relaxed, with a tongue resting on the roof of the mouth. You're sitting. 
Be allowing the nape of the neck to open slightly, tucking the chin down. Again, the gaze could be resting vacantly in space where your eyes would be closed, whatever you prefer. And most importantly, as we move deeper into the meditation, it will be useful to have a familiarity of relaxation. So bring awareness to the immediate experience of the body as we did before and notice the various sensations and feelings that are present. as we make contact with the emergence of sensation and feeling, we may also come to know through our discernment that there are parts of the body that feel tight, contracted, while maybe other parts of the body feel relaxed and at ease. And as an expression of self-compassion, bring attention to any part of the body that feels tight. And with each out-breath, give yourself full permission to relax and release. Setting the body at ease. And importantly, as we become more relaxed, see if you can also continue to remain vividly aware. Your conscious awareness will be indispensable in moving through this process of cultivating these seeds of familiarity with the different phases of the dying process. Internally, see if you can arouse a strong sense of interest curiosity. Focus this interest and curiosity on the incoming and outgoing breath. <clears throat> and give yourself a moment to allow the respiration to settle into its natural rhythm. which in itself is a great dress rehearsal for the process of dying and that we let go of trying to control the breath. Regardless of whether the breath is long, short, deep, or shallow, allow the body to breathe. And finally, we'll expand this capacity of relinquishing control of the breath to the mind itself and see, can we observe the mind without controlling or modifying the mind or getting caught up and carried away by it? And developing or revealing a internal reference point of awareness 
of knowing. And rest in the stillness of this knowing. Miss the movement of the mind. And in this knowing, we can just briefly touch into a quality that will reveal itself in the clear light. And that is that awareness is clear. There's nothing tangible. So like the sky without clouds, there's nothing obstructing awareness. And yet it's also knowing. And you become familiar with those two distinguishing features in the experience you're having right now. Resting in the stillness of awareness that is clear and knowing. And now let's use our imagination to invite these insights around the process of dying to our lived experience. And considering as best we can, what would these different phases of the dying process feel like? How might we experience them in the body and mind? So to begin this process, I first invite you to imagine that death is very near. We know this as the body becomes weak and frail. And we begin to experience the dissolution of the earth element. As the movement becomes harder, we lose strength. And we become heavier in the body, again with a feeling being pressed down into whatever is supporting us in this moment. And the eyes and the cheeks may begin to sink in. As we imagine feeling the weight of the earth we may also start to lose the sense of form within the body. Where the body and whatever's supporting us and the ground become one continuum of solidity. Sometimes as we feel this, there may be a natural agitation begins to happen in the mind to become heavy. So if you're feeling that right now, just notice. And also as the earth element begins to collapse, the experience of form I've mentioned becomes less defined. You may lose Part of our visual perception. And what we are left with 
is a internal vision of appearances. It's been like mirages. Losing solidity, but still appearing. And as the earth element collapses and then move into the dissolution of the water element, and which we might initially experience as a loss of control in the fluids of the body. Mucus may begin to drip from the nose. Saliva may begin to drip from the mouth. Urine is released. And then gradually, the water element begins to dissolve. We feel a dryness building in the body so that the nose begins to cave in, the breath becomes dry, grainy. Lips become parched. You may experience momentary thirst that is insatiable. We also start to lose the aggregate of feeling as the water element collapses. No longer tracking our experience through pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feelings. And our sense of hearing may become muffled. And as the water element collapses further, we're left with the vision of appearances becoming smoky. Miss swirling. And again, as we move through this process, see if you can rest the clear knowing of awareness, relaxed and at ease, but fully present. And as the water element dissolves into the fire element and transition into fire dissolving into air, which is marked by heat and drawn away from the feet and the hands, losing our appetite completely, no longer being able to assimilate food or water. Our digestion slows down. And here, all of the five physical senses become modeled and we're unable to make any clear distinctions, maybe forgetting the names or recognition of loved ones or whoever else. We may sense as the fire element continues to collapse, we experience a vision sparks, a 
fireflies moving in the dark sky. Again, observe this lucidly. And the clear knowing of awareness. And then finally, the fire element dissolves completely into the air element. And as the air element and dissolves into space, the body becomes completely immobile. At this point, the breath becomes uneven, the inhalation becoming much shorter than the exhalation, irregular. One duration. As the air element collapses, we lose the sense of volition, being moved in by intention for purpose and meaning. And as this mobility subsides, we may experience visionary experiences in the mind, present memories that we have throughout our life, people we've met, experiences that we cherish. Also, we may experience unpleasant memories, conflict, Memories that bring forth a sense of fear again. All of them just signs the air element collapsing, in which we can rest in the steadiness and ease, clear knowing. And eventually, the air element collapses. Where the incoming breath subsides or suspended in stillness, releasing the breath out. As the air element dissolves away, all the functions of the mind, the Force minds subside. We may experience the vision of a flickering candle flame. And then, as that subsides, the air element completely collapses. And like a flash, a full moon in the clear sky, the experience is called the white appearance. The white element begins to drop into the central channel from the crown of the head to the heart center, transforming any anger into luminosity. And then like an autumn sunset, a red emergence appears. And 
this red filling empty space as the red element moves up the central channel to the heart center. Mm -hmm. And these vital essences meet at the center of the heart in which we come to rest. In the dark attainment. An empty night sky devoid of any stars. or non-conceptuality like an ocean unmoved by waves. And then spontaneously the near dark attainment dissolves into immaculate emptiness. With luminosity that is clear, undifferentiated. That is known through unceasing awareness. Awareness that has never been born. Has never died, that is neither coming nor going. Intuitively, when you sense this dimension of knowing, Indivisible. And clear soul. And rest. Now from the experience of great bliss, indivisible from this clear light, imagine clouds of compassion begin to form. And feeling yourself spontaneously reemerge here and now in this body, this mind, but of the nature of clear light. before bringing our practice to a close, dedicate maybe 
positive energy, the merit of this practice. Support us all in swiftly realizing perfect awakening so that we may support all beings in that state of realization. Let's bring the meditation to a close. All right. Thank you all for exploring that. You see we have just about three minutes left away. Um, I'm happy to stay for an extra five, 10 minutes if people would like to just reflect back their experience. If people have any questions, I certainly, as, as we may say in Idaho, I'm not a hot shot here around this practice. So, um, you know, whatever has come up, maybe um, you know, have something to respond to, but otherwise um, something I think you can all look into. <clears throat> There's different places to find these teachings out there. And again, hopefully, if you're new to this practice, maybe a little bit of inspiration to explore this, to recognize, hey, at some point, it may go through this process. <laughs> so that's it for me. I open it up to you all again for the last few minutes. If you know we want to end right on time, I'm happy to do that as well. So uh, just here to be of service, whatever that means. Hi, Ryan, we have a question here in the room or comment. I'm not sure which. Okay, good. Um, yes, hello, Ryan. My question was about, you said that there was a darkness experience during the meditation when the two subtle body elements met. However, when I see like white plus red equals orange, it does not equal black. So where does the blackness come from? Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> it has to do with how our mind is just generally conditioned. So I think the closest parallel that we could we could draw to this would be the experience of dreamless sleep. So every night we go actually through this, this process. Um, if one were to fall asleep lucidly through, through the process, going to sleep, it said that you can actually experience these dissolutions, but these elements as they, as they're released in the body, they're, coming back to their original source, which is this place that, again, I'll, I'll just refer to it as the substrate consciousness or the subtle mind. And whenever, when that happens, then we're not totally unaware, but for most people it's so subtle that um, for all intents and purposes, we are unconscious, but we're still, there's still like a implicit awareness there because we can't be woken up from sleep. But in that process, it's the same thing. There's just no appearances of any kind there. So that the dissolution of these subtle elements as they come back into this ground state, we could say, um, we're just left with this empty, sometimes it's called a vacuity in which there are just no appearances. So it's not, I mean, and if, again, we kind of look at these elements um, as something intrinsically out there, independent of the mind, then yeah, it would make sense. Like, gosh, if we took red and white together, we would get orange. But actually the Buddhist understanding is all of these appearances in the first place are coming from the mind itself. So it's the mind 
the coarse mind withdrawing back into the subtle mind. And if we were to actually say, well, but what about the elements? Where are they? They're not intrinsically there from their own side. They're just appearances that are coming from the mind and phenomenologically as they withdraw, as the appearances all withdraw back into the mind, the substrate consciousness, the last two appearances that are left before this near dark attainment are what's called the white appearance in the red emergence, but they're all coming from the mind itself. So that's the dissolution that takes place, but they're not physically out there. So it wouldn't be like combining two um, types of paint together or something where you say, oh gosh, red and white should be orange, not black. Which in itself is a very interesting hypothesis that, <laughs> that all the appearances that we see and we experience are coming from the mind. Any other reflections, thoughts, or questions, comments? I know I see we're you know a few minutes over. So and people, if you have to leave, you know don't feel like be rude to click out of your screen or or to just get up and walk out of the studio. But just since I didn't give a lot of time for questions, and I think there's more dialogue and discussion that Eve and Chandra usually create space for. So I just want to honor that for at least a few minutes. And again, I apologize for my prefatory remarks going on so long. Thank you. All right. Well, if that is it, we will sign off. And yeah, what a pleasure to be with you all. I I vicariously live through Eve and her immense joy in being with you on a on a weekly basis. You're so lucky to have Eve and, and Chandra, I don't know. Um, I hear a lot about Chandra through Eve. But no, I'm so wonderful that you guys have this community of spiritual friends and I always love to come and be a part of it when I'm in San Francisco. And it's always a, a real honor to come and share with your community. So thanks for inviting me back, not kicking me out of here. And um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully I'll see you soon and have a, a wonderful evening. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome thank you. Anytime. Hi, Lonnie. Hi, Stan. It's good to see you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Okay. Good night. Um, just a quick reminder, next week, we're at the Children's Day School. Yeah. Because Ken Ben Wong Jell Rinpoche will be here, but he's quite well known, so we had to have it at a bigger venue. It's at 19th and Dolores. It's the Children's Day School. It's an old church that they've turned into a school. It's uh, right in the middle of Dolores Park. And so um, it'll start at 7. Um, but we'll, we will all be here, and this will be closed. This will be closed. And um, if you're volunteering, I'll send an email shortly. And uh, the setup, we're going to start from 5.30 to 6.30, and then uh, hopefully... Uh, Rinpoche will be there around 6.30 and start at 7. So, um, yeah, that's all. So just remember that we will be closed <laughs> next week, but please come to see uh, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, whose book we're reading right now. So, yeah, all right. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs>